Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, and I'm happy to have with me tonight uh, Brother Dave, who's been uh, made himself available to fill in for Sister Renee. For those of you who are not aware of it, Sister Renee had a death in her family a few days ago. And uh, of course, that's something that takes priority. So she's got available tonight. So everybody pray for Renee and her family at this time. Uh, also, of course, I have with me Brother Cripps. So uh, let me just ask Brother Cripps, uh, let each of you just say hi to the, to the viewers for a moment, and then we'll get started. Yeah, hello. Uh, my name is Jason Cripps. I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. We come on at uh, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Uh, and I'm on this show uh, every Wednesday on Sin City Preacher, which is uh, my great joy to be a part of these uh, studies. And also on uh, Monday nights, on Talking Doctrine for Monday's Milk. And I'm delighted to be here tonight with uh, Brother Dave. Brother Dave was on Monday nights. If you hadn't had a chance to listen to that, you can hear us both go back and forth a little bit. It was a great broadcast on Talking Doctrine monday's milk this past monday so doubling down on the dave tonight hello to the chat too mm -hmm. yes awesome all right and brother dave say say hi and then we'll get started hey what's going on everybody uh welcome to the wednesday night uh church service and uh glad to be here with brother cripps and brother luke uh, i'm glad you guys can join and make it and hopefully tonight you'll be edified yes Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure you've got some good edifying thoughts uh, on the scriptures, brother. And um, for those of you who don't know, brother Dave, uh, he, I keep on repeating this. He's he's one of the most powerful preachers of the gospel we have on YouTube today. So go subscribe to his channel. And um, I've often said that um, uh, what we're doing on a Wednesday night is Bible teaching, and then the difference between teaching and preaching really is. Uh, the element of passion and conviction in in, uh, in preaching, it's we want to make the people understand their need for the Savior, uh, and in teaching as we're going to do tonight, uh, we don't necessarily have to be as passionate. Or, <laughs> but we'll, I'm looking forward to the study with both of you. Let's let's get started. Uh, we're in First Corinthians chapter seven, verse seventeen, and in the KJV it reads. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all churches. Uh, let's, let's start with Brother Cripp, since he has the context from last week's study. To uh, Go ahead, Brother. Yeah, absolutely. But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. Um, this is an interesting verse. So uh, a lot of people get get this verse and other verses that talk about the like the measure of faith given to a man. Um, but he he's the one that gives all things. He's the one that gives us the ability to do all things, and uh, that's what it's talking about here. So uh, as many of you now, if Renee was here, she probably would have gone up a few verses and read from last week to put it in in context so we we've talked uh, last week if you didn't hear it we talked a lot about the the idea of marriage we, we got into divorce a little bit uh toward the end there very very good broadcast if you haven't had a chance to listen to that uh please do that but for tonight um uh paul's just talking to here uh, talking here about that god gives us the ability to do all things um, and that's in marriage it's in friendships it's within churches and um, uh, then this last sentence, Paul's saying that this is what he has set up. This is the foundation that he's set up through Christ uh, in all the churches. So mm -hmm. pretty simple, I think. Yeah, amen. I, uh, Brother Dave, um, I know you've, you've been uh, following along these Wednesday night Bible studies. You must be familiar with kind of the protocol. Of we, we're basically, I would call us KJV firstists. We want to look at the KJV. That's the scriptures we trust. And But we, we like to look at other translations. Uh, sometimes it's helpful. And sometimes when we look at a modern translation, we find a serious bad interpretation that we have to correct and address. But I'm going to read it now in the Amplified before you respond, Brother Dave. 
It says in the Amplified, verse 17, Only let each one live the life which the Lord has assigned him and to which God has called him, for each person is unique and is accountable for his choices and conduct. Let him walk uh, in this way. This is the rule I make in all the churches. Mm. Brother Dave? Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, what I'm getting from it is that, you know, not to be, um, you know, envious of, of somebody who's in a different place than you, but, but where God has you, uh, you know, we were teaching on this last night over on Talking Doctrine about, you know, using your spiritual gifts and your natural God-given abilities to find a place to serve the Lord. And, and, and it's okay to be in a different situation. So what I'm getting from this is, is that it's God who called us. You know, it, it's, it's God who empowers us and strengthens us. And we're all one in Christ. So let us just find a place where we can serve the Lord. In other words, we don't have to wait um, to be put into a certain position, we can serve the Lord in our everyday lives. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, the uh, part of the uh, the context was was talking about uh, how we live our lives and but uh, and marriage and divorce, but uh, also uh, the context of the First Corinthians as a whole is also, especially I remember in chapter five and six. Uh, how convicted I was studying those chapters again about how uh, as Christians uh, we are guaranteed eternal life but that does not give us a, a, a free reign to go live however we want because uh, we are ambassadors for Christ we do have a responsibility as representatives to be a good example for the world we should be a light that shines and if someone is um, living in a way that is besmirching the reputation of Christ's church, then the church is obligated to uh, do some kind of discipline and correction. Uh, so I think this verse here, uh, when it says, uh, um, in the Amplified, says, only let each one live the life which the Lord has assigned him. Uh, I think that part is, is referring to uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, ministry and gifts that were given. I, I've said this many times over the years that uh, uh, when a person is born again, uh, they uh, they not only become a child of God and guaranteed eternal life, but uh, they kind of punch their time clock and now they're on the payroll and the work begins. Now, don't anybody misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm, none of us are teaching that you have to work in order to get your salvation. You don't have to work to keep it. You don't have to work to, to prove it. But um, once we are a child of God, then we all have the honor and privilege of serving the Lord. And Jesus says, by doing that, we can build up treasures in heaven. And uh, Paul talks about the judgment seat of Christ too, where we're gonna be judged for our ministry. So uh, keep in mind that when you, when you are born again, that from that moment till your last breath, you're building up treasures or you're building up wood, hay, and stubble because the Lord does not value the work that you've done. So I think the first part of that, verse 17, is referencing our, our gifts, our calling, our ministry. And then the, it says, and to which has called him, each person is unique and is accountable for his choices and conduct. Let him walk in this way. I think that part would, of course, be referring to, hey, let's conduct ourselves in a way uh, that is going to be um, an example for the world to say, uh, if, if that's what a Christian is, I want to be a Christian. Unfortunately, especially in all my time of street preaching, I've had many people uh, say, if, to, regarding one of the street preachers, the way that they're being hateful and, and, uh, and you know, really um, vile. So some of the street preachers are really vile with the way that they're preaching. And the, the, the viewers, the, the public, their response is, if that's what a Christian is, I never want to be one. Yeah. So I think this is what we should be thinking on in verse 17. Uh, any, any more on that, Crips or, or uh, Dave? I think you pretty much hit it, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> that, got, that got it. All right, then. Okay, we'll go to verse 18 in the, in the KJV. It says, is any man called being circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called in uncircumcision? 
let him not be circumcised. Uh, then I'm going to read 19 along with it. Yeah. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Um, okay, so 18 and 19. Uh, Brother Dave, I'll let you go first on this one. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, I believe Paul's just reminding us that, you know, now through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, uh, and we are all one, uh, part of one body in Christ with Christ as a head. So, uh, you know, no matter our position, no matter our calling, no matter our different giftings or our, you know, different experiences that we're in, uh, as long as we just, uh, seek to, you know, do what pleases the Lord and, uh, continue in, in, in what we're called to do, um, you know, we should be all right and, and not to, um, you know, allow other people that are in other uh, situations or positions to to make us lose focus on where God has us in this season. You know, some are um, in the wilderness, some are, you know, being used in this area, that area. But all in all, I think Paul here is saying, look, circumcised, uncircumcised, we're all one in Christ. So let us just, you know, it says the keeping of the commandments of God is what matters. Um, and so, you know, it just basically let each one of us remain in our calling and, and focusing on growing in the Lord. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Brother Cripps, um, I'm going to read 18 and 19 in the, in the uh, Amplified. Uh, it says, was anyone at the time of his calling from God already circumcised? He is not to become uncircumcised. Has I don't know how that's possible. No. At least physically. Uh, has anyone been called <laughs> has anyone been called while uncircumcised? Well, he is not to be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm curious, Brother Cripps, uh, especially um, I think Brother uh, Dave expounded on the beginning, but this keeping the commandments of God is what matters. Uh, could you focus on that for me? Yeah, absolutely. To me, the commandments of God are wrapped up in the, the laws that Jesus gave us, which is love God with everything and love your neighbors yourself. You keep those commandments and that all the laws and the prophets are wrapped up in those things. And it just simply means, it doesn't mean you don't, you don't follow the Ten Commandments. It, it doesn't mean that, oh, well, it's okay to kill, it's okay to bear false witness, it's okay to do this, do that. It's just that um, everything's wrapped up when Christ came. He uh, came to um, to resolve the issue of sin, and he, he did exactly that. Um, so he, he gave us new command, which is wrapped up in the old commands, which is simply... Um, as I said, to love love God with all your heart, love Him with everything that you have within you to do, and and love your neighbor in that same way. Love the name, love your neighbor as God loves you, um, and that's for all relationships that we have. If we do those things, um, the implication is you're not going to have to worry about uh, not murdering. You're not going to have to worry about bearing false witness if you're doing those things and you're focused on God, the Holy Spirit is going to do such a work in you and be going to be bearing so much fruit in you um, that you don't have to be sin-focused. You just focus on, on Christ completely. That's my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Well, I looked ahead at the footnote in the Amplified. Let's look at that on, uh, on verse um, uh, 18. It says, Paul may be speaking figuratively of abandoning all of one's Jewish heritage and culture. However, there was a procedure in ancient medicine for reversing circumcision. Now that blows my mind. <laughs> I had no idea. Um, but... Um, no, thank you. I don't, really, I don't think that, I mean, even if that was possible, I don't think that's what Paul is talking about. He, because all, the, the, the circumcised people now are so concerned about not being circumcised if they're trying to f physically change that. Now, I don't think that's part of, that's in, uh, intended by Paul at all. I'm very skeptical of that. But um, the idea of um, being circumcised or not and the culture, uh, uh, obviously, um, 
uh, the, the circumcision really represents, um, you know, your your uh, your heritage. Your, your, do you come from the Jewish line where circumcision was a sign of being a Jew, uh, or are you a non-Jew where circumcision wasn't the designation that makes you stand out as a? Uh, but uh, I think he's really talking about the idea that um, uh, there should no no longer be a distinction. And, and when we get to, uh, what is it, uh, Romans, what was it in Romans? Um, I can't remember the chapter where he says there is no difference whether you're, uh, you know, Jew or, or yeah. Greek or Gentile, and there's no male or female. There, mm -hmm. There's there's no, so uh, these distinctions, um, we should just discard them. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but that was really shocking to me. What do you guys say about that, Brother Cripps? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's ridiculousness. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that. Uh, first of all, I don't. I don't know how it'd be possible. I've never even thought about it. Reversing circumcision. Uh, what would be the point of that? <laughs> and and biblically speaking, uh, Paul's not saying that at all here. He's saying, in fact, he's saying that it doesn't matter if you're if you're circumcised, great. If you're not circumcised, great. These are outward signs. I mean, today you could say baptism. You know, you can, you, you can, being baptized is an outward sign. It doesn't mean anything. And he's going to go go on, Paul's going to go on further in the next verse and, and make his point. He's saying whatever, I like what Brother Dave said, honestly. He's saying that, we're, you know, whatever your lane is that you're in, stay in that lane. You know, you, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything crazy. Um, and this may have been at that time it had something to do with the, the argument, the ongoing argument of whether uh, wh whether the uh, the Greeks that come in, um, uh, the Gentiles that come in need to be circumcised. So I'm not saying that wasn't an issue, but Paul's saying it doesn't matter if you you know it, he, he makes it very very clear that that's what he's saying to me. And um, I think the verses coming up will uh, put an even finer point on it. Yeah, um, I forget uh, when we did the introduction to this book, I forget uh, exactly when we were speculating that it was written, I think it was about 54. And um, I believe that the, uh, uh, the council at Jerusalem would have been about 50. It's about 20 years after Pentecost. Mm -hmm. So um, there would have already been uh, the council of Jerusalem at that time, for this issue, Paul went to confront the Jerusalem church, these church leaders over their claim, uh -huh. you can't be saved unless you're circumcised in Acts uh -huh. chapter 15, verse one. So uh, this uh, should have already been resolved, but look, just think of it. Uh, here it is, this is maybe 23, 24 years after Pentecost, several years after the Jerusalem council, and Paul is still having to address this issue of of the difference between uh, circumcision and uncircumcision, and yeah. uh, um, this, this, uh, I keep on saying that um, people, if you really want to understand the Book of Acts, which is, uh, and uh, and all these epistles that Paul that Paul wrote, and get the context of what was really going on in this first century church, you you have to realize that in the very beginning after Pentecost. There was no clue to any of the church uh, members and believers at that time that uh, one, Gentiles will be included, and two, that Judaism or the law has to be left behind. It took 20, 30 years. In fact, it hasn't gone away even today. <laughs> yeah. But um, the idea of thinking that you still have to practice the laws of Judaism or some kind of legalism along with believing in Jesus is still a problem today. Yeah. But during this book of Acts in this first century of the church, this system, this problem persisted. And here Paul's talking about the problem of uh, circumcision or not. Um, but it's pretty clear, at least Paul's position was that uh, you, uh, um, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Yeah. And um, if you are a Gentile, certainly don't think you have to get circumcised. And if you are a, 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 a Jew and you are circumcised, don't worry about that. Just just forget about that. That's not an issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, one last thing I want to say about the end of that verse. I asked you, Brother Cripps, about the what it said about the law. It says, uh -huh. but what are, what matters is keeping the commandments of the God. 
obviously, um, I, I, I really think you got it right in terms of, uh, well, what's he mean by the law following the, I mean, the commandments. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the commandments of Jesus, not the commandments of, uh, of Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that God wrote 10 commandments in stone with his finger. And then he instructed Moses to write down another 1,603 uh, on, uh, 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 with his hand. And, and so there were 613 laws in, in Judaism. Yeah. And, uh, but here's something that most Christians don't realize, and they don't compute this in the way they understand the scriptures. The laws that were given to Israel in Judaism were not given to the world as a whole. Even the Ten Commandments, this was for Israel, not for the Gentile world. The Gentile world was given something else by God, the, the knowledge of right and wrong that we inherited from Adam and Eve. When they learned what right and wrong was, good and evil, by eating from the tree of knowledge, it's something that we inherited, and Paul calls it the conscience. So we know naturally what's right and wrong, but mm -hmm. the Jews had it spelled out for them. Uh, hey, if, you're, if there's any confusion, let me write this down and spell it out for you, everything I expect of you yeah uh, so uh, I think it's important to understand when he says uh, keeping these commandments well it's the Jesus is condensed version of the commandments for the world uh, love God and love each other and also we must not construe that keeping these commandments are, are factor into our salvation they, uh, they factor into are we being ambassadors for Christ will we will we um, get rewards or will we be chastised Will we uh, suffer the, the consequences that every sin brings with it? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's how this, we should understand this when it says, what matters is keeping the commandments of God. Yeah, uh, Brother Dave might want to comment on that one. I don't know if he had a chance uh, for that end part, Brother Luke. Yeah, Brother Dave. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's the same thing. Paul was just using that as an example. And it's funny that you brought up the, the fact of people trying to uh, become, you know, circumcised, uncircumcised again. And actually there's an account in, uh, in the Maccabees, which I know is not God. I know it's not part of scripture, but there's a Jewish account of people who came to the knowledge of Christ and they became so shameful that they actually tried to become uncircumcised after they have been circumcised. <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of funny to hear about it, but, but Paul yeah. was just making, Paul was just making a point that, you know, that it's not really about circumcision. That's the example Paul was using. It's just, you know, he could have just said, you know, whether you're married or whether you're unmarried. Yeah. You know, it means nothing. But, but you know, serving the Lord is is, is what matters. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go back to the KJV, verse 20. It says, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Brother Cripps? Yeah, this is what I was referring to earlier that uh, Paul's putting a finer point on what he's saying and it has nothing about uh, nothing to do with going and being uncircumcised when you've been circumcised or <laughs> circumcised again or whatever. Um, uh, let every man abide in the same calling. Stay in your lane. Whatever whatever you are doing when God called you, you continue to do it. And I th I I think we don't need to to stay here. That it, if a person was involved in being a temple prostitute uh, for pagan gods, that they would continue to do that. But he's saying that you you know you don't have to you don't have to uh, change your whatever your calling is. Just just stay with it and don't worry about these outside things. Don't worry about the the things that everyone else is expecting you to do as as some some sort of um, additional sacrifice, as if the sacrifice Christ made on the cross wasn't enough, and we're still dealing with that today. And I don't want to go off on a tangent, but brother, you were talking about uh, it still being a problem uh, today. The Hebrew roots and all that stuff. We're all aware of what a, what a huge problem that is. And Massive. How, how many people are falling into that? And that's because I believe that why Paul brought this up even 50 years, as you were saying, Brother Luke, it probably had been resolved. Obviously, it wasn't resolved. It, it wasn't resolved, and it's still not resolved today. Yeah, they're not going on and on about being circumcised today, but it changes into something else. Something that was addressed in Scripture um, all those years ago is still a problem today because people are thick. 
they're they're thick in their heads, and and I I've been that way too. But the beauty of what God has to offer is truth and truth and wisdom. And when he opens your eyes and the scales fall off and he opens your ears and you're able to hear, then there's so much beauty in his word. And there's so much, so many instructions for us to be able to live while we're in this captivity. I mean, make no mistake about it. You're in captivity. You're, you're, you're a, you're a stranger in a strange land because the, the minute you're saved, you're a stranger to the world that you live in physically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I've been comparing the different uh, translations on this verse 20. And uh, I think that verse 20 in the KJV is quite unclear to me because this word calling, um, I've, I've always understood the word calling to mean uh, uh, what we're called to do in terms of how God wants to use us in our in our serving him yeah. um uh, i think that when it comes to salvation rather than calling it would be drawn god is drawing all of us but uh once we answer that and we respond with faith then he calls us into some ministry uh that's how i would i think the word calling would apply so but when i look at Verse 20 in the KJV, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called, and then compare it to verse 20 in the Amplified and the NABRE. It says, each one should remain in the condition he was, in which he was when he was called. And it's the same kind of a thing in the NABRE. It says, uh, uh, everyone should remain in the, in the state in which he was called. Oh, okay. So, uh, and I think when we go to the next verse, we see that we see it's, it's really talking about the state. Whatever your condition is, whether you're slave or free, whether you're circumcised or not, um, uh, you don't need to worry about changing that. Just do the best you can under those circumstances. Okay. Um, Brother Dave? Yeah, well, the, you just said it. Um, you just said it at the very end. I think that's what the whole gist of these this section of Scripture is talking about. Uh, Paul's just using examples of certain things not ben being more beneficial than others rather than just, uh, you know, where, you know, we have that saying, um, you know, meet them where they're at. And so wherever we are um, when, when, you know, we get in Christ or when we decide to uh, accept the gospel and put our faith in Christ, you know, God will take it from there. And so we don't have to worry about making drastic changes. We should just allow God to take us through the process and, and, and be okay with where we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you I think what? that's what he's saying when he's saying, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. Uh, we, we know in Romans 12, four, it says that there's many members of one body with Christ being the head. And the Bible says the Holy spirit distributes spiritual gifts as God wills. Uh, so we're all going to, you know, be a little different. We're all going to come from a different place. We're all going to be, uh, we're we're going to be put into the race, but we're all going to be in a different place. And so I think Paul's just stressing the point that all that matters is that your heart is circumcised, you know, being born again in Christ. And no matter where you are, not to worry or not to get overwhelmed, but just to take it from there, be content with where you are and let God take you from there. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to the KJV in verse 21. Brother Krebs, it says, Art thou being... Call, art thou, excuse me, art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. Mm -hmm. uh, can you unravel that? <laughs> you want the well, I, the, go ahead and read. I, I read the Amplified already, but it would make more sense to oh, everyone. Okay. Probably. Uh, in the Amplified verse 21 says, Were you a slave when you were called? Do not worry about that since your status as a believer is equal to that of a freeborn believer. But if you are able to gain your freedom, do that. That's amplified enough right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, again, it's the status, whatever status you're in. I like how the amplified puts your, uh, that uh, you're, as a believer, your status is equal to that of freedom believer. And that's absolutely true. We know that's true. Um, so, and, and, and that goes back to the idea of whatever, whatever calling it is. And I think he's talking about, uh, both things here. I mean, it can also be, 
your your job, like I was saying earlier, or whatever your your status is, wherever it may be, um, that's okay. And I and I like that he says here. But if you're able to gain your freedom, do that. I mean, so he's saying it's fine to uh, to not be a slave. I mean that, that that's okay too. Uh, but don't worry about it. Don't don't uh, put your time into thinking about that as being a problem. Uh, it's not. You know, you you have the same freedom under Christ. We're, we all have that same freedom, uh, regardless of our our, our uh, gender or um, our, our roots. You know, Jewish or or Gentile or whatever. And we all fit under the same umbrella. The word of the body of Christ now. So, okay, thank you. I'm gonna, brother Dave. I want to read it in the NABRE. It says. Were you a slave when you were called? Do not be concerned, but even if you gain your freedom, make the most of it. Hmm. Well, I think, you know, I see this in a whole different way. I'm kind of getting the idea that also Paul could mean, you know, you have freedom in Christ and be careful. Okay, he could be talking about a physical slave, um, under his master and that if he can get free, let him get free. But I kind of see it as almost like, don't let anybody, uh, I'm looking at it in a spiritual sense. Like don't let anybody, um, slave over you spirit. Like don't get in bondage. Cause you know, how Paul's always talking about, you know, don't go back to the yoke of bondage. Don't go back to, you know, the yoke and, and, and keep yourself free and Liberty. And, and I think he's also referring, it, it's possible that he's also referring to, um, don't become enslaved to man either, or maybe religion or, or the, or the law or, you know, like Hebrew roots, how they try to pull you under their system. And I think, you know, even if you, for a time, maybe go in error, you can still serve God, but if you can break free in the truth, then you ought to. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just kind of see it as Paul also saying that we, we don't have to be enslaved to any man. You know, we are, we are, we're, uh, servants of Christ, slaves of Christ. And even though we learn and build and fellowship with other men, uh, we got to be careful not to be brought into any type of bondage uh, through man either, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go back to the KJV for verse 22. It says, for he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Hmm. Okay, Brother Cripps? Um, I, I still feel like it's more of the same. He's saying that you're called of the Lord regardless of, of uh, whether you're slave or servant. I like what uh, Brother Dave's saying, and I'm not, uh, not disputing that at all. Uh, Paul oftentimes... Uh, he's not just talking about one thing. He's not just talking about one area. He's trying to use as little words as possible to to make a bigger point, I think. Um, and uh, being free, uh, we're all free. Um, I believe that the other translation is uh, backing up what Dave's saying and making that point better. Um, but it, it's the same thing that he's, <laughs> he's saying um, up top about being a slave and not being a slave. It's just using different words, being mm -hmm. a servant, yeah. All right, well, let's look at uh, the, the verse 22 in the Amplified. Uh, For he who was a slave when he was called in the Lord is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called is a slave of Christ. Mm. Brother Dave? Yeah, um... That's verse 22, you said? Yes. All right, it says, For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also that he is called being free is Christ's servant. Okay, so I think that means like, okay, like take a physical slave, for example. They have a master that rules over them. Uh, you know, when we become children of God, put into Christ, Christ becomes our master now. And uh, it's okay to follow uh, other men, but we should ultimately be following Christ. And if, you know, as Paul says, um, you know, follow me as I follow Christ, you know? So if, if I'm following someone or growing in someone or under a certain leadership, if they're not leading me 
uh, into more truth or closer to Christ, and I'm not going to follow such person and break free from them. Right. Mm -hmm. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it's interesting why um, I, I'm really thinking why is Paul making this point? For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. So he's saying, even if you are a servant, whether it's like a, a, you're agreed to be the man's servant or whether you are a servant in the sense of a slave, but whatever it is, uh, that, that uh, in reality, God sees you as a free man. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go, Luke. Yeah. But also, uh, he that is called if be free, being free, if, you are, if you're, your state is you know, freedom, you're not a servant or a slave, but you, in fact, you are Christ's uh, slave, uh, in that we we are uh, uh, we God. Uh, why why did God even make us? Why why did God save us? What is the purpose of it? Well, Ephesians two ten tells us that He made us for this purpose to serve Him and to do good works. So He has some uh, job in mind for us, and, and uh, so in that sense. We are all servants of God, but we certainly are, uh, the, how well we're serving God varies greatly. Uh, some people, you know, there's a there's a, a, a phrase that I've objected to for 33 years, uh, that uh, to get saved, you gotta surrender your life to Christ. Yeah. Well, we know you don't have to surrender your life and sur or surrender your will over to God to get saved. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think it's important to understand that once we receive this eternal life as a gift, because what Jesus did and not, nothing that we've done to get it, well, when we, when we have that, uh, we should understand that, uh, um, I forgot the, the point that was, uh, let me see. Gosh, what was I just saying before that? Help me, brothers. Uh, forgot the one I was going to connect the dots on that. <laughs> that we were just, you know, we're we're basically, you know, saved unto good work, saved to serve oh. the Lord, and you know, even if like in our in our earthly oh, yeah. life, surrendering. Right? Thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah, surrendering. Right? Yeah, surrendering. Okay, what if we do get saved properly? Because we're understanding that we don't earn our salvation. And yet we should understand that now we now that we are gods and we are his ministers, that uh, we we really should, as it says in Ephesians 2.10, the word should is there. It doesn't say you must do works, mm -hmm. but it says you should because that's part of God's intention for your life. Mm -hmm. So well, how do we do that? Well, that where, that's where the surrendering does come in. We, we, we want to surrender our will over to the Holy Spirit, allow the Holy Spirit to uh, renew our minds, make our minds agree with the mind of Christ, uh, and, uh, and, and gradually uh, the will of God is, plays out in our life. Uh, so we do want to surrender after we're saved, but how successfully we all do that uh, you, we we must not judge other people's salvation based upon how well they've surrendered their will over. None of us, I don't know. Well, there may be some, there may be some great Christians in, throughout history that we can say they've completely surrendered their will over to God. But uh, I, I don't know any personally right now. I don't either. All right. Uh, did we, uh, we cover verse 22 and all the, yeah. We did. Yep. So yep. now we go to this, Great verse 23 in the KJ yes. says, Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So you're bought with a price. Um, I thought at this point it was going to go into uh, God's blood being um, the actual blood of God that was uh, paid for it. Uh, maybe that's coming up or I'm thinking it's maybe it's somewhere else. But you're bought with a price. Um, Brother Dave, I'll ask you to go first on verse 23. What was this price that was paid to buy us? Oh, the precious shed blood of Jesus Christ. And, you know, his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, God sending his son to 
uh, live that perfect life we couldn't and to yeah. shed his precious blood to atone for our sins. And we were purchased at, at a high price. And so, therefore, uh, you know, we become not only children of God, but servants of God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, the word, uh, let me see, uh, servants, uh, let me see. For you, are thou called being a servant? Uh, I'm trying to find. It. Am I uh, imagining it, or was the word slave used, or did I read that into it? I, it, I guess it says servant rather than slave, uh, but obviously, it's servant in the sense that you're not free. It's not servant like I've agreed to work for someone as their butler, and they pay me a wage. This is servant in that it says in verse 21, uh, you're not free. You're servant in the sense that you're not free. So that really is, that's why I'm construing it as this is a slave. Um, but uh, when we get to verse 23 and it says you were bought with a price, isn't that what happens with a slave? Someone yeah. purchases with a price a person and they become that person's slave. Well, ah, good they, analogy. You know, and, and, and Paul saying that's exactly what happened with us. We were bought by God with the with the price of Jesus' shed blood, and therefore we are slaves to Christ. But how good how good a slave or, or servant are we? Uh, I I I wish I was better. I I wish we could all do better. Uh, I'm really uh, I do know some people that. Uh, they seem to like give up a lot. Maybe they'll become a missionary. Maybe they'll go over to some foreign country that's that's adverse to Christianity, and maybe they'll even be martyred. That's happens even today. It's happened all throughout church history. So these people really have taken this, bought with a price. They're slaves. They are uh, going to do what God called them to do, and they're really surrendering all. But that kind of person, like Paul, Paul was that way. Uh, so uh, ask yourself, are, are you like that? I, I cannot boast that, uh, that I, I've surrendered to that kind of extent. Mm. Let me read that in the uh, Amplified, verse uh, 23 for Brother Dave. You were bought with a price, a pre precious price paid by Christ. Do not become slaves to men, but to Christ. Brother Dave? Uh, yeah. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the ultimate call. Um, you know, becoming children of God purchased, uh, Paul says in Ephesians one, that we are a purchased possession of God. And the Bible says that we, uh, Ephesians two ten, as you brought up earlier, Luke, that we, you know, are, uh, redeemed of the Lord and we should, uh, serve him unto good works. And, and so to bring glory, you know, Matthew says, let your light shine before men that you may glorify your father in heaven. And, so basically, our Lord, our Master, is is God or Christ, and and you know we shouldn't let um, or become the servant or or follow men or leadership, you know, in the sense of like a servant. Or it's okay to serve, you know, your local church. It's okay to serve elders. It's okay to serve, but as far as the overall. Uh, direction I think Paul's getting at is that Christ is 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 our master and and ultimately we're serving him. That's very interesting. I I hadn't thought of it that way. That when it says don't become a servant of men, uh, that we could really apply that to the uh, the established hierarchy of of our religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but Paul uh, it says. Uh, Gosh, was this, did we get to this point? Uh, uh, well, uh, maybe I saw it in the footnotes where uh, Paul is giving them directions, uh, instructions, uh, actually laying down a ruling. Let me see. Uh, all right. 2017. Huh. Well, I I think that uh, I don't know if it's a verse we covered or a footnote I looked at earlier, but um, 
Paul is dictating to this church um, things that uh, he's telling them they must do. And he's exercising some authority over this church. So um, it is clear to me that even though Paul is not the local leader of the church, where it says some are of um, Apollo, some were of uh, Cephas, some were of Paul, and, and so on, and and and, uh, and of Chloe, as we talked earlier, that even Chloe had a congregation in her house. But um, whoever was the leader of that congregation, uh, Paul uh, seems to be saying uh, that he has the authority to dictate. Now, is it because Paul uh, established the church? He planted the church. Uh, I would think that because he says that, that he is their spiritual father, remember a chapter or two earlier, we're talking about, maybe it was this chapter earlier, but he says, I am your, your, your uh, spiritual father, not in those exact words, but we talked about how this idea of the Roman Catholic priest being our spiritual father, how that was uh, stolen from this part of scripture where Paul refers to himself as their father in the sense that he led them to Christ. Um, but he seems to, um, you know, I, he planted the church. He probably led some of these people to, to, to Christ. And, and now even from afar, he is exercising some kind of authority from a distance over this congregation. So it seems to me that at this point in time, even at that point in church history, there was a, a little bit of hierarchy established. Now, uh, I don't think that uh, Paul intended and, and that uh, God intended for us to establish a church hierarchy as you have in Romanism, uh, where you have the laity as completely subservient to clergy, and then the clergy has all these different levels uh, all the way up to a pope. Uh, I don't think that was God's plan, but uh, it seems to me that Paul does uh, is uh, asserting some kind of authority from afar. Uh, give me your thoughts on that. Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, Paul, Paul's the uh, number one guy in that area, for sure. He, and all the churches that he laid the foundation for, as I mentioned earlier. So, yeah, he's he's speaking with authority and and they they respect his authority. Um, and so this is his ministry, whether he's visiting the churches or he's sending people to visit the churches in his stead or sending the letters uh, when he's um in prison, uh, all of it's with authority, and he he uh, he does have that because he's the one that planted a lot of these churches to begin with. Um, so I, I would agree with what you said for sure. Mm -hmm. So, brother Dave, do you have any insights on this? Uh, because uh, it, by the beginning of the second century, you know, I've done a lot of study of uh, church history. I have a playlist titled Early Church History. I hope everybody will go, go watch that. But uh, really, right as early as this second century, we can see this hierarchy of, of um, uh, church leaders being not just over a congregation, but over cities and then over uh, uh, groups of cities, another one. And uh, whether you want to call them bishops or, or uh, um, other other titles that were developed uh, in religion or not but can you see that this might be the beginning of that and uh, do you think that Paul or, or, or Jesus uh, really imagined or wanted us to have a great hierarchy as you see in, in religion today no absolutely not I, I don't think they were for that um, I do I do think Paul wanted um, leadership authority over the local congregation as far as the overseer or the bishop or what we would call today as the pastor or you know the people with the different giftings um not not in a hierarchy sense but in a just in a uh, a, a positional sense um not that anyone's better than anyone else but that i believe paul set order uh in the churches and and i think that as time went on like you said uh, certain religions, certain branches that broken off into different denominations became to put uh, people in positions that were, um, you know, almost like lording over different areas or, or, or like you said, a hierarchy. And especially in, in Catholicism, when, you know, having to confess your sins to another man in a box is just ridiculous to me. And 
uh, having to, you know, call the Pope father when Jesus said, call no man your father. It, you know, it's, I just think Paul's making the point here that, you know, we, we become uh, uh, slaves to God and, and, and he's our, he's our ultimate go-to and it's okay to follow men um, as long as they're, you know, helping you or guiding you or strengthening you in your pursuit of God. But if they draw you after themselves or they're drawing you away from God, then you got to get out from under them. Yeah, and I, I think part of the point you made about, it says, um, um, being a um, servant of Christ, not a servant of men, uh, there, I believe that I can uh, infer from Paul there that he would have not been in favor of uh, having a uh, laity uh, uh, under the foot of a clergy I think that Paul's uh, concern and, and, and felt feeling that he had some kind of authority uh, was because there are certain churches he established. He taught them the real gospel. And as we know in, in Galatians, what happened that uh, he's, he says, I taught you the gospel and I'm and right after I leave, you're all into this false, false gospel. Someone's bewitched you. And, and so uh, I think that Paul's, um, the way Paul saw this is that not that he wanted to have authority, but he felt a responsibility to, uh, since he established these churches, that he was responsible to, to stay in, in contact and make sure that they were still uh, in the faith and were, were not being, uh, you know, uh, apostatized by uh, the, what the Bible calls the Judaizers. Because, um, you know, as we all know, um, Paul uh, was plagued with this thorn in the flesh, and it's my theory that that uh, if you read the, all the verses before that and get the context of that, I don't think the thorn in his flesh was a physical malady. I think it was uh, a pain in the ass, as we would say today, a thorn in the flesh is those uh, um, lordship heretics that are trying to run our congregation and, and always trying to uh, uh, destroy people's faith here on YouTube, they're a pain in our ass or, or they're a thorn in our flesh. And that way in Paul's day, they were the Judaizers going to all of Paul's churches trying to say Paul's a false apostle. And don't we hear that? The accusations against us and, and, and that we're teaching the wrong uh, gospel. Um, so I think that Paul is exercising this authority not because he he wants to have authority, he values authority and wants a hierarchy, but because he had an ongoing responsibility um, to, to them to make sure that they did not go astray from, because the Judaizers were working real hard to, to ruin the faith of, of all Paul's congregations. Yeah, and Paul warned him. He said when he departs, uh, grievous wolves will come in behind him trying to... Uh, you know, um, per, um, pervert the flock. Amen. Um, okay, um, brother, brother Cripps, uh, you think I'm reading too much? I'm, I'm speculating and I'm trying to put pieces together. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm obviously I don't want to eisegete and say that it, it, that's what it says. But these no. are the, the, these are the conclusions that I'm coming to. No, not at all. The point you're making is correct. He 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 uh, set himself up in place as the the uh, person to uh, lay the foundation because he got a, a direct meeting with the Savior, Jesus, and and Jesus put him to task on all the stuff. So certainly he had authority, and uh, not uh, intending to have it be set up like the Catholic Church set it up. I mean, you made your point very clear, and, and I, I don't disagree with that. But when we get a chance, I want to get a chance to actually comment on the verse that we read whenever whenever we're ready. Okay. Uh, um, all right. I, As you know, my mind gets scattered, and I forget who, who, who talked about what. I'm going to read the next verse and then let you comment on all the verses, including 24, because 24 is the end of this, his thought on this. It says in KJV, verse 24, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. <clears throat> okay, begin at whatever point you uh, you need to, brother. Yeah, well, it, it when we read 23 originally, I wanted to comment on that because I, I wanted to tie it into what you were saying about surrendering your will because something occurred to me mm -hmm. when, when we were talking about this originally. Um, it says, ye are bought with a price, but not ye the servants of, but uh, not ye the, the servants of men. 
um, on that one, you're saying talking about the people that say surrender your will, and that made me think of the of those same people that say uh, serving God and surrendering to Him will cost you everything. It'll 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 you know cost this great price. And the the thought that occurred to me is Paul saying here that you're bought with a price. The price that that Brother Dave was talking about. You asked him directly you know, what he thought that price was. And he accurately said the price was uh, the blood of Christ on the cross, the redemption and uh, the redemption of our souls. He bought us, he paid for us. So then the idea of surrendering our will as if that's the price, Christ already paid it. It's already paid, he's already redeemed us. We're not having to pay another price. Sure, we're, we're uh, going to pay a price, you know, in terms of uh, the end time situation. Some of us may die for him. Some of us may die for him before that, before that event actually takes place. So yeah, that'd be paying a price, but there's no price that needs to be paid. It's already been paid. And I think that also ties into what Paul's saying. You don't have to do anything else. If you know, you don't have to put yourself in a different status. If you can, if you, can, if you're a slave and you, you, uh, uh, can get out of that, then then fine, do that. You, you don't have to do anything else. The price has already been paid. You're Christ, you're a slave, as Paul has said in other verses that we've done studies. Um, we're slaves to righteousness, so we're no longer slaves to law, we're no longer slaves to sin and death. This body will die, but we're slaves uh, to God. We're servants of God, the way that you're uh, describing it. Of course, we should be the best servants we could be. We should be. And and the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the ability to do that because without him, we don't have the ability to be good servants at all. And it's just by his grace that he considers us uh, great servants that uh, when we see him, he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And that word could be slave. You could switch the word servant with slave. Well done, thou good and faithful slave. We're slaves to righteousness. He bought us, he paid for us, so we're definitely slaves to him. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, Brother Dave, unless you want to say more about verse 24, I'll go to the next verse. Well, just real quickly, I just want to touch on what Cripps just said with the whole uh, teaching of, you know, salvation is free, but it will cost you everything. Yeah. No, it costs Christ everything. Yes. It, like Christ didn't write a check that's going to bounce. Okay. Ooh. And, and so these people are trying to put in your mind. Yeah. It's going to cost as far as, you know, you may lose some worldly friends. You may, yeah. you may lose some employment. You may, mm -hmm. you know, you may struggle and kick and scream with your flesh when your flesh wants to do all this wicked stuff and you have to fight it. Yeah. I mean, you may, yeah, you may, it may cost you that stuff, but the way they make it sound, they make it sound like Christ wrote a, a bad check. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, that's a. Uh, that's a, a famous line that's absolutely uh, a contra contradicts itself. It's kind of an oxymoron, you know. It's uh, it's free, but it'll cost you everything. Yeah, I mean that really you cannot say those two things. One cancels out the other. Thank you. Uh, um, there's another one that's uh, like that. Uh, oh yeah, um, you're you're saved by faith alone, but saving faith is really never alone. Right. <laughs> Total oxymorons. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, so uh, the, the people that, that say those things, they do not understand the gospel. They don't believe the real gospel. And it really boils down to, as we say, we keep saying this problem, if we trace it back to man's psychology and, and DNA problem is uh, pride. Uh, we, That's it. We have, uh, they're, they're, these lordship teachers are still full of pride they really think they're so deluded that they think that their good works are so outstanding and they got rid of all the bad things that are like perfectly i guess they're wow. deluded uh, uh, and so they are uh, uh, they are uh, they either don't understand or they're unwilling to accept the concept of a free gift mm -hmm. and they uh they they think that well it's too good to be true uh, you, uh everything in life is a merit, merit system you know, you get what you pay for, uh, you know, you get, uh, and um, the the problem is, um, I mean, the truth is, uh, there is a merit system. God does have a merit system, okay? 
uh, but it's not for salvation. The merit system is for the believer who received the gift, and now the merit system goes in, and, and we're going to be judged by our works for, for treasures in heaven. So if you're, if you're someone that wants to be on a merit system, trust Christ and, and receive this gift of eternal life, uh, and, and then, okay, now get, get busy working, and now, okay, you can, it's, it's about how, how much good works you can do uh, if you want to get your, uh, your treasures in heaven and mm-hmm. do well at that judgment seat of Christ. But I suspect also that um, it's not only what you do, but the motive behind it uh, will, will determine if it's wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, precious gems. I, I get fired up about this, Brother Luke, because just this past week, Jen got a letter from a, a close friend, and she, uh, she's saying to Jen, I've got this friend that's telling me that she sold everything she has and the job's coming next. She's going to quit her job and sacrifice everything for Christ. And she's suggesting that this, this friend do the same, that that that's what she needs to do. That's the, I, this idea of surrendering everything like the rich young ruler, like Jesus said, the rich young ruler, go and sell everything that they, they don't understand. Just as oh boy. Christ. They 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 want to give up everything that they have, including their jobs, and just you know live for God, sacrifice everything, and they're telling other people to do the same. And just as you said, they don't understand the gospel. They don't understand that the, the price has already been paid. They don't have to go sell everything they have. They don't understand what Jesus was saying and the reason why he was saying it. They don't dig into scripture en- enough to get that, and they have their misinterpretations, and they try to lead other people astray. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have to. We don't have to do anything else. He's already done it. We, we yes, we need to be good servants to him, as you were saying, brother Luke. The, the you know the merit system and all that, based on the things that we do in service for him. We should, we should do these things. We should um, uh, be good workers and good servants and good slaves for him. He he owns us. Mm-hmm. Well, I. Uh... I think that the the person that does sell everything their own they own, and use that to fund a missionary trip or give it to the poor, and then and then they go let's say works with the homeless and 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 lives with the homeless and that kind of thing. I would commend it. Uh, sure. on that I'd say that's admirable. Sure. Uh, if 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 you're doing it not without the motivation of earning salvation, but because you want to. Uh, uh, love your neighbor and serve God, uh, that's fine. But if you're doing it and, and your motivation is to work for your salvation, mm-hmm. then it's it's vanity. It's 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 worthless. Yep. Not only that, but you know, the Lord the Lord was was telling the rich young ruler to sell all of his possessions. Um because Jesus already knew his heart yeah. and that he would he would not give up um you know, his possessions. And even though he claimed to be righteous by his deeds from a child, Christ already could see beyond that. And, and he hit him where it hurt. And that was his, his love for his things and his status and his wealth. And Jesus told him to sell all that he possessed to follow him. Mm -hmm. And he went away, you know, and the scripture says he went away from the Lord. Mm -hmm. Jesus is not literally telling us to sell everything we have because I mean, he also wants us to be uh, wise. Like God doesn't make it rain hamburgers. He doesn't make it rain, you know, money. And so, you know, he tells us all through the scripture, we got to work to provide. And if we go and sell everything we have and, and then just have nothing, what good will we be uh, after, after that money runs out? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I believe that when, when Jesus said, uh, cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, go and be perfect, uh, sell everything you own and come follow me, pick up your cross and carry uh, follow me. Uh, all of those things fall under the, on the same point that Jesus was making. And that is he wants to make people find the end of themselves and realize that they're in a hopeless, helpless situation, that, yep. that it is impossible Yep. For, to do, for them to actually do everything he's requiring of them. Yes. And they will then respond the way the apostles did. Uh, with their, After the rich run ruler left, the apostles turned to Jesus and says, well, based on everything you're saying here, how is it possible for anyone to get saved? 
Mm -hmm. it, you're making it's it's impossible what you're uh, expecting. And he says, "Now you understand. You get the it. Man, it is impossible. Yep. You need to understand it's impossible for you to earn it, and that's why you need me. Right. Good yep. point. And it's impossible for you to be righteous enough unless your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. You shall not even enter heaven. And the Pharisees weren't even righteous. They they thought they were." Yeah. And so you, I think you hit the nail on the head right there and that Jesus was using these hard sayings to get people to come to the end of themselves to receive him. Yep. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, let's go uh, back to the KJV for verse 25. Paul's moving on to a new thoughts now. Uh, it says, now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I'll read 26 also. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be, so to be, uh, I guess I have to keep reading, 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Um, the, the, everything's really connected here, but I'll, I'll stop there for now. Um, Brother Cripps, 25, 6, and 7. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know much about uh, the virgins part here, but he, uh, then, he's, then he goes to, in 27, talking about, uh, that makes more sense to me, verse 27. If you're, if you're married, stay married. If you're not, you know, if you're not married, uh, don't don't seek a wife. Um, again, we're back to the positional thing. I, I believe he's saying whatever, wherever, whatever lane you're in, stay in that lane. Um, I would like to hear the amplified on this because uh, I'm, I'm going to read that for you now. Then 25, yeah. 26, and twenty seven in the amplified it says, "Now concerning the virgins of marriageable age, I have no command of the Lord." But I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think then that because of the impending distress, that is the pressure of the current trouble, mm. uh, it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be released. Are you unmarried? Do not seek a wife. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Crips, uh, now that you have the benefit of that. Yeah, so the impending distress that 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 helps a little bit. So I I think that relates to the period of time, the persecution that they were under. Uh, uh, so so saying of virgins of mar marriageable age, uh, there there isn't a command from God, but He's presenting His opinion, um, and considering Himself trustworthy because the Lord chose Him. The impending distress again, as I described, uh, the the current trouble, or well, it'd be like in in prophecy terms, this period of tribulation that we're going to go through. Uh, you know, if, if we're still alive, then this this current era of people is alive. Then, um, yeah, if you're married when that time comes upon you, that uh, impending uh, distress. Uh, if you're married, stay married. And if you're not married, don't get married during that time. It, it may be so difficult that it would seem ridiculous even. Uh, that's the way I see it. I don't know what else to say about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brother Dave? Yeah, that's the, that's the same idea I have. But I think Paul is saying, you know, it goes back into the earlier verses where wherever God has called us, you know, we should be okay with and not you know looking to other places and so i think paul here is, is saying you know if if the women or the men are are you know of age to marry but they're virgins you know let them continue to serve the lord and until they find a spouse or or, or that even happens right. and if the person is already married let him stay married and if the person's not married let him not to be so eager to seek a wife because in times of distress as crips was saying if things aren't really good, say say the economy's bad, mm. or you know we're under great distress, or or, or a financial uh, you know a crisis around the world, it's going to be much more burdensome and difficult for you to take on a family. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
And so I think Paul's just reiterating what he said earlier in the chapter, which is, you know, serve the Lord where you are and, 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 and be okay with it yeah. until, you know, God either, you know, opens new doors or other things change. But, and I, and I think Paul, I think Paul here is just giving practical advice mm -hmm. because it's, there is a part in the verse where it says, you know, if one does marry, he does not sin. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think Paul's just giving like general and, and he's saying that it's not a command. It's not like straight from the Lord, but it's his own apostolic authority as far as like a, a general guide or general principle. Mm -hmm. It's it's not literally saying that if you don't do these things, you're going to be in sin, but he's just giving you practical advice, uh, wisdom pretty much he's given. And so I think he's just telling the virgins to remain serving the Lord that way uh, until things change, if they change. Uh, to those that are married, stay married. And to those who are not married, don't go seeking marriage in a time of distress like that because it's going to be even more burdensome. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, I, you've alluded to uh, this times of, of, of present distress um, as um, uh, possibly that uh, the hard times of maybe an economy or uh, war or whatever, and, and maybe f some future time like that that we will face, uh, uh, that, that may be relevant to this. I don't really know, uh, but I, I'm not seeing anything that would make me uh, uh, say that is what he's talking about um, based upon anything in these verses. But I, I, I would be inclined to think when he says the this present distress, uh, I would go back to the distress of the problem he's been dealing with all along about uh, uh, fornication, uh, being frustrated over your sexual uh, needs uh, and being married and the conflict between if I marry, I won't be able to serve the Lord as much because I'm responsible to my wife and children. But uh, if, I'm, I, if I'm single like Paul, can I deal with it? Because I'll be frustrated be, uh, uh, without any uh, sexual uh, outlets. And on getting back to all that, I, I think it's the it gets back to the distress of this particular problem. Um, but I'm not so sure that if, you don't, if there's not some merit in what you said. Um, now, virgins, uh, so he's saying, uh, not concerning virgins, I have no commandment. So Paul does say some things interesting in this uh, chapter that uh, I've always found interesting. And, and a lot of what he's saying, he's telling us or letting us conclude that he's giving us the words of God. Uh, and then certain times he departs and says, now, these are just my words. These are my thoughts. I didn't get this from God. It's just my counsel to you. And uh, how is he qualified? Uh, as we said earlier, we I don't think any of us think that Paul was experienced as a, a married person. Some people say that he had been married and he was a widower. I've never heard that before until last week or two. Um, but, uh, so how was Paul qualified to give marital advice to every everybody? Um, uh, I think that it's just based on the experience. Uh, and he was so learned. I mean, some people would really uh, say that, uh, uh, you know, there are some people who are good counselors that don't have personal experiences, but they're very educated. And they've studied uh, particular subjects. So, and Paul was very knowledgeable and studied uh, uh, you know, he knew as much as any of the philosophers and educated people. So maybe he felt that he was qualified in that sense to give people marital advice, but he was careful <laughs> to say, I'm not getting this from the Lord. This is my own advice to you. Yeah. Well, let's, you know, let's not leave out the fact that he's an apostle of the Lord. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think that in itself gives him enough authority. Uh, you know, he, he, he was taught of the risen Christ and, he was uh, commissioned by the risen Christ. He was empowered by the risen Christ to go and lay this foundation. Paul, uh, you know, who knows the supernatural wisdom Paul was given by the Lord. And it's a good thing that he said, you know, I have no commandment of the Lord. I'm not speaking for the Lord, but I give judgment or I give you counsel. And, and you know, to me, that's all the authority he needs. He's the apostle. Yeah, I'm not questioning his his no, no. judgment. Oh, no, 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 not you, brother Luke. But I'm saying there are people out there that argue against that and say, "Oh, he doesn't have you know the right to uh, 
uh, critique uh, what people should do. And this, everybody yeah. has a rhyme or reason these days instead of just taking the scripture for what it says and, and trusting it. Yeah, I, I think, and uh, you know, I've talked about my own experience in, in these things, and uh, I believe that Paul is giving excellent advice, get excellent counsel uh, on this. But what I'm pointing out is that he does make it a distinction. And uh, I've, I've always found that fascinating to me that a couple of times in all of Paul's letters, like just a couple of times he says, I want you to know right now I'm talking for myself. Yeah, yeah, so, that's um, wise. Yeah. I'll so, tell you one thing. Oh, sorry, brother. Go ahead. I'm just saying I, I always found, found that fascinating. Go ahead. I find it fascinating too, but I, I'm telling you, he wasn't married. <laughs> just based on the way he's talking, he's presenting this opinion of his. He based definitely on, wasn't married. Based on being a bachelor. He's saying, guys, listen, man, if you're married, fine. If you're not married, don't get married. You can serve the Lord better. And that's the, that that's his perception, the way he's looking at it. I'm not saying it's not right. I'm just saying he's presenting it from you know, it'd be like me not ever be, being married and telling a married guy, oh, well, I mean, stay married, but it, it would have been better. It'd be better for unmarried people if, if if they stay unmarried so they can serve the Lord better. Because he, I mean, he was he was diligent in that way. And he was vigilant um, in his singleness because his calling was from the Lord. He met Jesus, literally met him on the road and it changed his life completely. And he talked about someone being fired up. Paul was fired up. So he's he's leading other people. He does have the authority to do it, but he's definitely doing it as Brother Luke is saying. Yeah. He's he's stating it's my opinion, you know. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's an opinion based on my knowledge that God's given me and the mercy that God's given me. Um, but it's from the standpoint of someone that was never married and, and clearly never yeah. married. Uh, I, I find it interesting in the KJV in verse 26, he says, I suppose, therefore, uh, the way that I, I would interpret him saying, I suppose, is that he's saying, mm, I, I think this is probably the right way to, to think about this, but I'm not, I'm not saying I'm absolutely, I'm right about this. I'm, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, I that, suppose. Uh, and, uh, and, and but then he also is in 27 he says art thou bound unto a wife seek not to be loosed so in other words paul is saying that it'd be great if you could be like me yeah single committed full-time to the lord no other responsibilities wives and children uh but but uh if you're going to be frustrated sexually then you need to be, have a wife uh, or be, need to be married i guess we apply that both ways the wife would need to be have a husband uh, but it says, um, she says, so don't seek to be loosed. Don't, don't try to get free from your wife. If you're married, and just because I've been telling you it's great to be single and serve the Lord full time, uh, don't leave your wife so you can be like me. <laughs> art, thou, art thou loosed from a wife? Okay, if you, you don't have a wife, or if you are, let's say, you're a widower or divorced, or uh, seek not a wife. He says, don't, don't, don't even think about getting married then. Now, if you don't have a wife, now you are free. But again, back to the previous verse, he says, but if you're going to burn, <laughs> you know, not in the fire of hell, but burn with lust, <laughs> and be frustrated over your, your uh, lack of uh, sex, then uh, you better get a wife. Yeah. All right. We'll go to the verse 28, uh, unless, um, Dave, any more before I go on? No, it's all good. Yeah, I think you hit it. I think you hit it just right. Yeah. Okay. Then verse 28 in the uh, KJV says, uh, but, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. <laughs> Crips. Yeah. <laughs> That's a Rubik's cube. Uh, do you want me to read in the amplifier? You you got that figured out. Oh, I got this one figured out. But go ahead well, and read go ahead, it. Okay. Go ahead. So um, again, he's making the same point. But if but if uh, you marry, it, you're not sinning. Same thing as circumcision. Same thing as all the other things he said. Um, not a problem either way. Whatever whatever your condition is, um, whatever your lane is, go ahead and stay in that lane. No problem. Um, and the verse above, if you're bound to a wife, uh, you know, don't try to get out of it. If you're loose for a wife, 
And if you're not married, don't try to seek a wife. Um, but if you decide to, again, I like that you pointed out he's saying suppose. So he, he's still presenting this opinion. Um, but if you, uh, but if you, if you marry, it's not a sin. If you're a virgin Mary, uh, uh, it's not a sin either way. So you're not sinning if you decide to do that. But then this point, nevertheless, you should have trouble in the flesh. He's, he's uh, saying, I believe it will say in the Amplified, so I'm trying to spare you this issue that's going to come up. If you if you get married, you're going to have more trouble. And um, I uh, read ahead a little bit, so I'll save my comment, but he makes this point uh, more clear uh, further down. Let's, let's read it in the Amplified, then Dave can give us his thoughts. And the Amplified, verse 28 says, But if you do marry, you have not sinned in doing so. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned in doing so. Yet those who marry will have troubles, special challenges in this life. And I am trying to spare you that. To all you unmarried people, listen to Paul, what he's saying. <laughs> Well, me being an unmarried man who does desire marriage, but, you know, I understand where Paul's coming from because, as Cripp said earlier, um, you know, when we get married, we take on new responsibilities. And now, you know, God wants us to love our wife like Christ loved the church. We got to, you know, provide for them. We got to, it's a whole new ball game when you get married. Uh, versus if you were single and able to serve the Lord at will, freely, uh, you know, pretty much in any capacity that you would want to. But when you get married, you can't, you got to, there's, you got to try to find a balance. You're going to, if you're a man that likes to uh, be, you know, completely say uh, evangelical minded or evangelist minded, and you like to go, go, go and preach the gospel, yep. you're going to hang that up when you get married. Cause the, the yep. wife ain't going to allow you to be gone all that time. Mm -mm. That's why I say Paul. Paul's not married. He was yeah, never he's, married. He doesn't know a woman. He has no idea. Uh, well, he has an idea because he's saying, you know, he's saying what you're saying, brother Dave. Which yeah, is, it's going to be difficult. And yeah. and he's saying that you know, if if you're okay with that and you want to serve in that capacity, yeah. as far as you know, serving uh, uh, in the home and in the family more so than than serving the Lord in other capacities, then then okay, get married. Um, but if that's just not your cup of tea and you you know, want to serve the Lord in another capacity, then getting married may not be the most wisest choice. See, and, and I might get a lot of flack for this, but again, he's he's saying it from the standpoint of never having been married and from, from the standpoint of being a single dude. Because I believe that uh, maybe some people are called to be married and other people are called to be single. And that's very, very possible. I know having experienced both uh, I know that a good godly marriage with God at the center of the marriage, for me, for me, just for me, I think I serve the Lord in a greater capacity because I am I am lifted up by having uh, a helper. Um, just from the beginning of time, I believe that that's the way God designed it. Overall, his overall design was that man shouldn't be alone. As he said, as he said uh, when he created Eve, he said that to Adam. Um, uh, that's his design. Uh, and uh, Paul was not called to be married. Great, great for you, Paul. No problem. Uh, some people, I, I, you can still serve the Lord, and some people uh, can can do that better when they have someone helping them, someone guiding them uh, that they can guide, uh, washing them uh, with the water of the Word, and uh, they can lift each other up. And that's what I choose, having experienced both. But Paul didn't choose that. His advice was just. You know, if you're married, fine. Don't don't get unmarried. But if you're not married, you can serve the Lord better. Bottom line, from a, from a single guy's perspective, he should have said that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I I am sure that uh, there are many uh, Christians who are married that that marriage works great in ministry. They're a great team. Uh, they're. Uh, partners in their in the ministry works and that's a that can be a powerful thing a wonderful thing um but then also there's uh people get married and they're unequally yoked mm -hmm. and that can be a very very difficult thing it is uh, a lot of times people are not believers one becomes a believer 
and and uh, uh, and then that kind of thing instead of working as a team, uh, working against each other actually. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, go ahead, Chris. I sorry. I just want to make one more point on this equally yoked thing. Also, equally yoked isn't just about belief. I, I can guarantee you that. It's not just someone saying they believe or they're a Christian, quote unquote. Uh, that's what I went through. I, I went I went through meeting someone that on, on paper said they were a Christian, said they were a believer, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't do my due diligence to find out what that meant from mm -hmm. her perspective. So unequally yoked, uh, it, 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 it uh, covers more ground than just someone saying they're a Christian. That's the only thing I just felt I had to add there. Yeah. Okay. I think this is probably the right place to stop for the night. Uh, let's that gives gives us some time to uh, give our final thoughts here. Cool. Uh, um, let me ask uh, first, uh, Brother Dave. Um, what would you like to sum up as far as what you uh, got out of the study tonight and the time together? Well, the study tonight was very edifying because we see a lot of these issues you know to this day like when paul was you know we still see the fragments of the judaizers basically just coming upon us today in different forms you have the hebrew roots movement which is you know has many different uh different arms so to speak that that try to reach out and bring you back under the law back under bondage when you know paul is is fighting his whole ministry that that we have our freedom in christ and we're everything is found in the finished work of christ and so and then he also gives us some practical wisdom on you know those of us who are uh, growing up in the lord and, and beginning to serve the lord in different ministries different areas uh you know we ought to be wise about how we uh you know whether we should be married or whether we should not be married um you know whatever god has for us and and you know we should not really get overwhelmed with with not being where someone else is but paul gave us the wisdom in saying that we should just serve christ where we are you know it's okay to go slow it's okay to let god build you up it's okay to be in the wilderness and and the main thing is, is what paul said is that we you know grow by God's word and, and, and try to do what pleases God. That's all that matters at the end of the day. And so uh, tonight was very edifying. It was uh, a lot of interesting points. And, um, you know, it, it, it just, it kind of opened my eyes onto some different things as well on how I saw these verses before. And so uh, I, I greatly benefited from it tonight. So it was good. <laughs> okay. All right, Brother Cripps, give us your summary of tonight stay in your lane whatever your lane is <laughs> uh no he uh he went on to talk about the, the I, I think we did a really good job of um you know trying to put it in uh, perspective and uh i liked the, the the thing that i liked the most probably was uh brother luke you pointing out that a, a few times in, in scripture paul does present his opinion and it's interesting to me when when he's doing that and people cherry pick scripture from those times when he's presenting his opinion and uh, use that to prop up some doctrine. And, and it's done with these verses here that he's talking about. Um, and, and in fact, the whole Catholic church idea, I, I believe that uh, it, their idea of uh, the priests not marrying and all that is taken directly out of this opinion of Paul. Um, and I, I think there's some evidence to, to back that up. So. Um, and Victoria uh, Sarton said in the chat, uh, she's encouraging people to read scripture for themselves. And I, I completely agree with that. You need to read all the scripture yourselves. I mean, don't just listen to what we say. Uh, you know, we want to amplify things and, and uh, talk about it, discuss it. And these are great edifying discussions, but um, nothing beats you uh, asking God for the, um, uh, to open your eyes and ears, your sight and hearing. And for you to look at scripture, pour over scripture yourself and, uh, and and read it for yourself. All of these verses that we go over, you can do that. Hope you're, Hopefully you're doing it as we go. Uh, but if not, either way. So stay in your lane, whatever condition you're in, um, whether, you know, whether you're a slave or, or free, whatever, um, all that's fine. You don't have to get uncircumcised, you know. Uh, you don't have to do any outward things, um, but you're you're a slave to to Christ. You're a slave to God, and 
be good servants. Um, you don't have to. You don't have to do anything else. He's already paid the price, and uh, uh, you don't have to. You don't have to pay another price by surrendering everything, surrendering your will and all that. Of course, you should. You should do his will, but uh, it's it's not for salvation. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Brother Matthias is producing the program tonight. I know he's uh, listening and been paying close attention to the entire talk. Uh, nothing controversial came up that we needed to ask his opinion. So, uh, Matthias, would you like to take a minute now to say anything or give us your thoughts? Just hello. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, all right, then. Uh, I would just sum up by saying that uh, uh, I really enjoyed this time tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, especially like Brother Dave being with us. Uh, I really enjoyed your company and your thoughts. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to thank everybody in the chat room for being here and listening. Uh, look forward to uh, next time. And Let's yeah. not forget, as I said in the very beginning, uh, Brother Day is filled in for Renee tonight because Renee is in distress and she yeah. and her family needs our prayers. Yeah. There was a death in the family, cl mm -hmm. close family member, and uh, she is scrambling, having to make some adjustments uh, yeah. and dealing, dealing with this grief. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I kind of doubt that she'll have her Thursday program tomorrow. Maybe she'll right. want to do it to get her mind off of things. or I don't know. Uh, but I do know we're, we're planning on having the fellowship Friday, so uh, I'll see you all then. And um, unless there's anything else anybody wants to say. Yeah, just right. thank you, Brother Dave, for filling in, man. I enjoyed it as well. Uh, I'll, I'll... No problem, guys. I appreciate you having me. I appreciate everyone in the chat. Um, had some good conversations I was reading in the uh, in the in-between time, and there was a lot of conversation going on there. Uh, <laughs> always thanks to the, we call them the mod squad, <laughs> Hendrix and Victoria and everybody else, the moderating the chat. You know, we appreciate yeah. that. And, and, you know, it's always good to see the people in the chat coming to fellowship. And it's always good to bounce ideas off you brothers and, and learn stuff from you too. So uh, it's Amen. been a pleasure. Amen. Thanks, Brother Dave. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We appreciate everybody in the congregation, in the chat room, and uh, especially the the mod squad. I didn't know what you meant originally when you said mod squad, but the moderators. Yeah, awesome. The mod squad. Yeah, you, you, should, you should you should know that, brother Luke. That's a term from from uh, late sixties, early seventies. The mod squad was a TV show on TV. Uh, I can I can I can still picture them very clearly. Yep. All the members of the mod squad in the TV yep. show. Yeah. There you go. Oh, and I, okay. I did want to say before we left tonight that Christian metal is not of the devil. <laughs> okay. I love everyone. Um, okay. Love you Thank too. you, everybody. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.